Hello, and welcome to another episode of Somewhat Accurate History, a podcast where we vaguely remember the history of various countries. Apparently, Wales is not a country. Alex, do you think I should cheese this one and pretend it to let me tell you about, or just do the somewhat accurate history thing? I mean, it's pretty much a history episode, Dad. This is my domain. I can do whatever I want. This is my house. If you don't, if you want to let me tell you about, I'm gonna take this ball and I'm gonna go home. I mean, technically speaking, you are telling me about it. It does still fit. Yes, it's incredibly broad podcast name, so it applies to anything. You know what it really applies to, Alex? What? Uh, it's probably coming up with a better intro. <laughs> but we don't have time for that. So, Alex, <laughs> in the 1800s, people started to interact with neighboring countries and were able to pretty reliably travel across the sea. We had a lot of reasons why we wanted to do things. Pretty bad reasons. And not a lot of good reasons. Like, we didn't have a good grasp on how to do things. By the end of the 1800s, we had already explored the Congo, we've charted the deserts, and made really good headway in slaughtering most indigenous people. <laughs> but there were two areas we didn't know fucking shit about. The North and South Poles. So the Arctic and the Antarctic are pretty much unlivable white wastelands, and hearing white and land made 1800s explorers dick super hard. They needed to get there. Okay, 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 okay. So, as, as, a, as a minor history buff myself, I know that everyone in, in the previous years are stupid as hell, but I have to ask, was it really that easy? <laughs> it was really that simple, they really just want to go there because it was white land? It Literally, the reason why is just... No one else has been there. Okay. Now, okay, this was a real thing. I was that... worried for a second, because I'd believe it. So, they just wanted to get there. It's the only fucking place. Look, why did we want to go to the moon? So we could look at rocks? Well, we well, for, I mean, we didn't go to the moon, Alex. Watch Stanley Kubrick. Well, going to the moon was just a pissing contest. So is this one, but I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> you're right, you're right, you're right. You're on this. Never mind, keep going, keep going. So, uh... The reason a lot of people wanted to go up there is, one, no one's fucking been there. What the fuck's up there? There were people that were, like, actual scientists who were on record saying, hey, I don't know, maybe the Garden of Eden's up there. Uh, I heard there's an ancient race of giants. Maybe they're up there. Fucking, um, I don't remember the name of it. It's a really famous novel where there's, like, a hole in the Arctic and there's a bunch of fucking dinosaurs up there. Oh, yeah. It's the movie where they go into, like, the core of the Earth, but the core is, like, a fucking place for the jungles oh. and dinosaurs yeah it's it's journey to the center of the earth and they enter through the uh, arctic or the antarctic i don't remember which yeah so people had been poking around north greenland and the russian coast to find better trade routes for a couple hundred years most of those trips involved one of three things these are the three outcomes of an expedition number one you go five miles further than the last you name like a river after yourselves and then you go back Number two, you try to go further, the crew commits mutiny and kills you. <laughs> or number three, your expedition is trying to find other expeditions that never came back. So there's one particular expedition that really caught my eye. This is a story of a man with a dream. A man unsatisfied with being warm and alive. <laughs> it was Solomon August Andre's dream to fly a hot air balloon over the North Pole. <laughs> Okay, uh, now... Do you have I'm questions? Not, I'm not an expert, but I have to say, how can you have a hot air balloon in the coldest place on Earth? That is a very interesting question, Alex. All right, well, listen. The answer that, to that uh, question is, uh, so Solomon was born in a village of less than 3,000 people <laughs> in a place called Sweden. And now there's actually, I'm going to, I'm going to try and read the city name, but there's a lot of dots over the vowels. So I'm going to do my best. He was born in Grana in the Junkoping area of Sweden. He went to school for mechanical engineering and through one reason or another ended up as part of the Swedish exhibit for the Philadelphia World's Fair as a janitor. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Alex, now you might be thinking, oh, this isn't so bad because it was a schoolhouse exhibit. 
He wasn't even the janitor of the exhibit. He was cleaning up the vomit from the overexcited fairgoers because in the 1800s, a Ferris wheel was too exciting. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is the fair, right? So this is just a, is this a, wait, a science fair or a regular ass just like it's like fair? it's like the world's fair. The the Swedish, ex- you know, they had people from all over, from different countries put up an exhibit, and theirs is just like, hey, check out a Swedish schoolhouse. Because what oh. the fuck do the Swedes have? They got skull. They got loot fisk. Who cares? Here's oh, a schoolhouse. Man. Time for the schoolhouse exhibit. Oh. <laughs> oh my god, is that a teacher's desk? Ugh. So while he was in the United States, he met this guy named John Wise, a famous American man who was maybe a little too much into balloons. Do you remember that episode of My Strange Addiction with the guy who was like sexually attracted to balloons and they would pop him and he would like start whimpering? This dude is like <laughs> Mylar Balloon Fan 1800. He flew more than 400 trips in balloons he designed himself and he only hurt himself seriously maybe like six times. Oh, only? Yeah, only only six whole time suits. Yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about it. So some of his really successful trips involved uh, opening... He was trying to open up the gas valve on top of the balloon. He lost control and it exploded. How high was he? How did he live? It, uh, listen, balloonists are fucking nuts. I love them. So three months later, this is like consecutive, these three. I was blown away, much like he was when the gas valve exploded. <laughs> So, he tried to fly from an event in Pennsylvania, this John Wise guy, and uh, during the ascent, somehow he was thrown from the basket and knocked unconscious, and the balloon just flew away. That's embarrassing, but at least that one's not too bad. So, six months later, he tries to leave from the same place, and actually works this time. He flies like 75 miles, which back then, that's fucking poggy. Like, holy shit. So, he lands... And he's emptying the basket, and the fucking balloon explodes. Ha! I mean, at least he was on the ground this time, so it couldn't have been that bad for him. And then later in his life, when he was an adult, he tried to use a hot air balloon to fight the South in the Civil War. How did that go? It got caught in the trees. It was never deployed. (laughs) I was worried. I was expecting him to get, like, ten feet off the ground before someone shoots him, and it explodes, and he still somehow (laughs) lives. So as you can tell from these little John Wise trips, balloons are a fucking really safe method of travel. In fact, they're so safe, it wasn't until 1838 that John Wise himself developed a parachute emergency system in case a balloon explodes in midair. So before that, if your balloon just popped because a bird flew into it, you were just fucked. So, okay, Alex, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how his safety mechanism worked. Uh, I, I didn't expect it to, to be a good one. So your balloon, you know, you you, uh, you went, you know, you, you sneezed. And so your balloon explodes. Now, what happens is that it folds into itself and makes like a little cone and it just starts whipping you around in circles really fucking fast. (laughs) Then you slam into the ground and it throws you 10 feet from the basket and technically you survive. (laughs) Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. So I I used to launch model rockets. I know there's a a little like fucking, not really a parachute, but it's kind of like a little streamer thing that works kind of semi like a parachute to help reduce the, the lag while you're falling. So I assume what he was trying to do was make the balloon kind of spin to kind of make a makeshift propeller so he wouldn't fall as fast. And it just exactly. didn't work because it was the 1800s. What uh, his his version of the parachute did, like, help people figure out, oh, if you just cut a hole in the middle like a donut and you give it like a vent, you can actually control it. And they're like, oh, so th- his balloon, his like parachute did actually lead to like real parachutes. But I'm going to tell you another really fucking cool thing about balloons which is how you land and deflate them. So balloons naturally lose buoyancy over time, and then you land on the ground, and you're still kind of like hopping from the wind, right? Because it's a fucking balloon. So to actually land a balloon, you have to crawl out of the basket, and like like, like a cartoon, you have to run over and ho, 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 like nail in some stakes into the ground. Yeah, actually, I I know this. A bunch of people I used to know used to have a, a hot fucking air balloon. Oh, Jesus, how white can you get? 
Uh, so then you clamber up on top of the balloon and you turn the gas release. Assuming it didn't explode and scalp you, your weight would then push the balloon inwards and you deflate it using your own body and probably fall on your neck or get strangled in the cords and die. So John Wise, this god amongst men, was like, hmm, what if I just had a pole cord and use that to open this gas hole? It took them years. I fucking love balloonists. They're nuts, dude. So Andre is hearing this. He's like sitting in the schoolhouse, crisscross applesauce. And he's listening to this battle scarred old man, like throwing shit off the desk, talking about how he fought the South. I forgot we were there this whole time. We were just so focused on Wise. Andre's like, yo, dude, I love balloonists. They're fucking nuts. So he's like, man, I love balloons. That's all it took for him. And that's all it took for me, honestly, to get in love with balloons. Like, I kind of see... Maybe Mylar Balloon fan knows something that we don't, Alex. (laughs) Andre goes back to Sweden, and he opens up a machine shop, but his heart's just not really in it, you know? He just... He really wants to be in a big ball of hydrogen that could explode at any moment. Preferably over a landscape he would certainly die in. (laughs) So he closes up shop and becomes an assistant at the Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden, where he meets friend and boss Nils Ekholm. He works with Ekholm studying meteorology and air electricity, which is obviously nowhere near as interesting as a stupid fucking balloon. (laughs) Okay, question, question, question. So he just joined up as an assistant without any credentials? Like, I'm a janitor, let me fucking work here? Well, remember, he he went to school for mechanical engineering. Ah, okay, okay. And okay. then he was working at, like, a some place that was like, hey, do you want to go work at the World's Fair? And he's like, oh, the most exciting place on the planet? And he had, like, heart palpitations, and they told him he would be sweeping. <laughs> so Andre saves up a bunch of money and buys his own balloon for patriotic purposes. What do I mean by that? So every other Norwegian country has been picking away at the North Pole, except for Sweden. Sweden was like the big boy. Like, of the Nordic countries, Sweden was the one with the most political influence. But they're being outshined by everyone else. Kind of like the US and Russia space race, where Russia got, they got ahead of us. We're like, oh, fuck, we need some Nazis, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I I, I know. (laughs) So Andre originally was more interested in using the jet stream to travel across the Atlantic from east to west. The jet stream is like, this is for the air nerds in the audience. I know there's a lot of you, especially in a balloon episode. It's like just a big old fucking stream of air that just wraps around the earth. Kind of like Superman when he turns back time. Anyway, so he saw people were more willing to pay to get someone to the North Pole rather than just get them over a bunch of warm, livable water. (laughs) So he was like, okay, okay, I can get it. So he sees this chance and he takes it to get funding. And then he ends up like, he ends up really getting into it. He's like, yo, the Arctic's kind of fucking sick. So he starts publishing his balloon runs in the news using his own balloon that he bought to kind of drum up attention and kind of give himself some more legitimacy for this plan. So he starts giving speeches for his like proposed trip above the Arctic, right? Uh He's running around telling people about it. He would talk about how during his runs... He would travel really goddamn high, almost as high as a commercial airplane, Alex, which is like thousands of feet in the air. Wouldn't it be really, really cold out there? Uh, I'll really up that up high. Yes, because you don't have uh, any anything that can keep the radiation from the sun. Yeah. So it just get it gets really fucking cold up there. And what happens when it's really, really cold is that atmospheric weirdness. Listen, I'm not a balloon scientist. As atmospheric weirdness happens. That makes like the stuff that's in the balloon kind of dissipate or chill, and then it starts going down. So this dude, he'd go like fucking thousands of feet up in the air, which is way higher than you should go with a balloon. Or he would get so low that he would skim across the surface of the ground or the water and slam into rocks. In one instance, he ended up accidentally crossing the entirety of Sweden and the Baltic Sea into Finland. But he was convinced he was still in mainland Sweden and just crossing a lot of lakes with lighthouses. <laughs> so I think he's ready to go across the North Pole. Okay, so so he's already not too bright. I can see that part. He, he's hit the big times, right? He's going. He's given all these speeches. And I'm going to paraphrase the speech he gave the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. This was the speech that swayed the King of Sweden, Oscar II 
and Alfred Nobel, the guy who invented dynamite and the Nobel Peace Prize, to cough up a fucking bunch of money. So, uh, <clears throat> and pretend I'm doing this like a really racist Swedish chef voice, okay? Okay. The history of geographical discovery is a history of great peril and suffering. However, nearly every hindrance can be said to contain a means to success. Natives often bar the way of the explorer, but just as often, they become his friends and helpers. Lakes and rivers carry him places and provide food and water. In these places, there are people who have been where you are going and can tell you the best way to get there. In the Arctic, the cold only kills. There are no places to rest, no vegetation, no fuel, and no natives to help you. Just a field of ice that invites to a journey. Unfortunately, this field of ice crushes ships, crushes men, and is too difficult to cross through normal means of travel. However, there is another method. I refer, of course, to the balloon. <laughs> he then explained he would need $38,000 to fund the trip, and this is in 1886 money, or 1896 money. Okay. And he was pelted with questions by experienced explorers like, how will you steer? And do you know what Arctic storms are? And are you aware it's really fucking cold? <laughs> so, okay, so this is 1890, right? Uh, 1896. Okay, so he knows it's cold, right? He's not stupid, right? He knows <laughs> yes. it's at least chilly. He knows it's fucking freezing. But what he's going to be doing, he's not going to be using, like, air. He's going to be using hydrogen, which doesn't care as much about being cold that's okay. his that's his that's his uh his fucking trump card that's his that's his specialty that's his gimmick to getting over there so there was one objector in particular this was an american dude his name was general adolphus Greeley, who had a lot of really successful expeditions he's got like 38 rivers named after him but he had one notable failure so this is apparently what actually happened and I'm quoting from like a from like a like a like a news source here. Andre pointed a figure at General Greeley and said, "When something happened to your ships, how did you get back? I risked three lives of what you call a foolhardy attempt, and you risked how many? A shipload." As Andre leaves the stage, the audience cheers until the Great Hall of the Colonial Institute rings. So he just ignores the questions, dabs on him for killing a shipload of men, and then leaves. What an asshole! Andre raised a million dollars. What? That is a million dollars in 1896 money. That is 30 million dollars now. Jesus fucking... So this is all for... This is all for, to go to the... To, to go to an icy hellhole. Yes. Because Sweden really, really, really wants to be the first ones there. So what's his actual plan, Alex? So his plan is to construct a custom balloon and leave from North Norway and land in Russia. Or maybe Canada. I don't know, it depends on how the wind blows. He's not sure which direction it will go. I assume that's how he pitched it. Along the trip, they'll cross above the North Pole, and with all the copious scientific equipment they have on board, they'll bring back all this useful information and a complete map of their journey across the ice. Because there was no maps of Arctic. Or Antarctic areas. It was completely unknown. So for his balloon to go over the North Pole, it had to have four conditions. <laughs> it must be at least somewhat steerable. It must be filled with enough hydrogen gas to stay flying for 30 days. The hydrogen gas must be manufactured and the balloon filled at the launch site so that it doesn't leak by the time they need to leave. Okay. And it had to be able to carry 6,000 pounds. Enough for all three men and all of their equipment. So that's okay. a pretty big list. Okay. Honestly, though, the, the last three don't sound that bad, but the first one make it steerable. I have no idea how you can steer a balloon. Luckily, Andre knew how. So oh, he had shit. his own method that he invented through his fantastic test roads where he was slamming into rocks. So his method of steering was uh, drag ropes. So what he would do is that he would have hanging off the side of the of the balloon. I almost said boat. A boat taken to the Arctic. God, that would be fucking dumb. <laughs> he would drag these heavy ropes along the ground. And the friction would be enough to slow the balloon. Like So let's say the wind is going 20 miles an hour. With the drag ropes, he would be going 10. Which means he could use sails to actually change direction. 
And uh, using this method, he could get up to 27 degrees away from the wind's direction. So as long as the wind wasn't blowing in the other 306 degrees he didn't want to go towards, he could easily make it across the North Pole. Okay, so it sounds very inaccurate. <laughs> that sounds very bad. I'm not, I'm not an air guy, but I don't like the sound of that. He would also be able to go non-stop. One of the other concerns was, you know, how are you guys going to stay alert? He'd be going over the Arctic summer, so the sun never sets. Which means you would almost certainly become snow blind because the sun is constantly going. And fucking fucked up like all that goddamn snow. So he had a special building put up at the Norway launch site on Svalbard Island uh, to house the balloon. It was this weirdly shaped, like, it looks like a fucking Psychonauts building. It's like this big circular thunder dome, and it's got a six-story tall, like, mini skyscraper thing. And the interior of the building is all covered in felt, the windows are made of gelatin, and it had a cloth roof that could be torn away, so that there was no sharp edges, and the thing could launch just fucking instantly, as ah, soon as the wind was good. Okay, that makes sense. Gelatin windows, though. I don't imagine being... I don't even know why they had windows, honestly. You didn't have to see out the windows. Maybe they just wanted to see what weather it was? I guess. I, yeah, I mean, I guess they can't just open up Google and know what it is. So, uh, the balloon is named the Eagle. And he orders it from this famous French balloon builder, who I can only imagine was named, like, Croissant Balloon Fan 1896. <laughs> they had it built and sent immediately from the workshop to the building, where they were actually going to fill the balloon and do all that horse shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the balloon, and in the Imgur album, there's a bunch of uh, pictures of the balloon and stuff we're going to talk about, and yeah, all yeah, three yeah. of the main of the main characters. Uh, the balloon was 67 feet in diameter, which is 15 feet longer than a semi trailer. Like it's big. Uh, the basket was a double-decker one, and it was lined along the sides with, like, storage spots for them to put all their scientific equipment and, like, their food and their water and all their supplies and shit. It also had a, uh, a dark room so that they could develop photos. Uh, the wackiest part of the balloon, besides the gas hole, was in order to cook food, they had to find a way to keep a stove on board. You can't have an open flame in your flammable basket with your flammable hydrogen. So they had to get creative. So what they did is they had this thing called a Primus stove, which is this really cool invention that's like a blowtorch mixed with a hot plate. <laughs> and they couldn't keep that on board, right? Yeah. So what do you think they did? They had it dangling on a rope uh, under the balloon. Yes. 26 <laughs> feet below the balloon. They had a bunch of mirrors so that they could look and see if something was cooking. Well, they had, they, had, they were cooking it while it was dangling? Well, yeah, what are you supposed to do? Pack food that doesn't need fire in your hydrogen bomb? Shut up, Alex. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know how the fuck they were supposed to extinguish it and bring it back up. They must have had, like, one of those old person walkers that you can squish and it's got, like, the fingers that pinch. Or they had, like... A 26 foot long fucking like fork that they just had on board because having that fire would be too dangerous. I imagine they have one of those super little robot toy like hands, but it's really long to turn the thing off and bring the food back up. So Andre gathers his league of extraordinary gentlemen. He contacts his old boss, Nils Ekholm, to conduct meteorological research and gather info about how air and shit works up there. Then he also gets a young student named Nils Strindberg as a photographer and map maker. Yes, both of them were named Nils. Alright. The launch was delayed a few times, because the wind just wasn't really working with them, and Ekholm started to have some doubts. He was concerned because the balloon was never tested before it was shipped out there. So, it was leaking in a few spots. Can you uh, guess how many spots, Alex? 24. 8 million. Wait, what? <laughs> the balloon is leaking along every one of the 8 million stitches that actually held, because it was two pieces held together. So he brought it up to Andre, and he's like, hey, this is, hey, this is a fucking problem. 
So Andre's like, listen, buddy, listen, listen. Again, with a racist Swedish accent. This is now a big deal. I'm going to fix it with my super secret special varnish. But Ekholm wasn't convinced. Each day he ran the numbers, and the balloon was losing 150 pounds of lift every day. Which means they have 6,000 pounds to start with. They're supposed to last 30 days. That's not going to work. Balloons always lose lift. That's just how they work. But 150 pounds, that's, a, that's enough to be very worried. Yeah. That means that you've only got, like, 20 days of airtime. So, Ekholm was so concerned about this that he told Andre he wouldn't be going on the next expedition the following year. He was still game to go on this one. What? He was ready to get eaten by a fucking polar bear. But, no dice. Their launch window came and went. By the time the wind was blowing correctly, it was too late in the year. So they disbanded, and they're like, all right, listen, boys, let's meet up again next year, 1897. Hoorah! 1897, the same year that Orville Spatz came up with the best gorilla joke of 1897. If you haven't seen this fucking image, it's going to be in that stupid Imger album. I hate it so much. Could, could you please tell the joke for the audience? Here, I'll read the gorilla. You read the zookeeper. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Gorilla. Did you hear about the gorilla who escaped from the zoo? Uh, no, I did not. That is because I am a quiet gorilla. Muffled sounds of gorilla violence. <laughs> Best gorilla joke, 1897. There is a <laughs> lot of competition there, Alex. <laughs> I like how it still reads like an internet shit post. We really haven't changed. This is partially why this episode took me three weeks to do. Because I was like, oh, this is a funny gorilla joke. And I just spent like two days finding out who Orville Spatz was. That was a series. My favorite one he ever did was, Hello, ma'am, would you like this apple? Oh, no, thank you. Why not? Because it is 1900 and we do not have fluoride in our water, so I do not have any teeth. Apple seller. Ha! I lost my mind. <laughs> the adding in a laugh where it's like, obviously my audience is too fucking dumb, so I'm going to add in a laugh. Uh, mm, it's good. Okay, so Alex, can you guess what the special super secret varnish Andre coated the balloon with was made of? I assume honey and glue. Nothing. Andre lied. Oh, okay. So his engineers on site had told him the balloon was leaking, and he told them to top the balloon's hydrogen every morning before Ekholm ran his tests. So the balloon was actually losing even more lift than Ekholm had feared. Why, 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 okay, there had to be some way to fix a balloon that was leaking. Why, why did he just do it? They had, they had like $38 million. So there's two factors that I think. So to fix something that's that fucked up, you would just have to get an entirely new balloon. And remember, this was already delayed by one year. And so they, I they think fear, what made him... They fear if they delay it anymore, another country's going to swoop in and take the prize. And peop Or people would just stop giving a shit. So... I think that I think there were two reasons why he was willing to put his himself and his crew in danger. So technically, the balloon could do like 14 to 17 days, even with the heavy leak, which, according to his calculations, that was enough for them to make the trip like that could totally work. 30 days is our huge buffer that we have. We'll be fine. And international media was all over this fucking story. Everything he did was reported as far, like, it was in China, it was in the United States, it was in oh. England, it was everywhere. Because people were like, yo, I love balloonists, these dudes are nuts, it's like a fucking Jules Verne novel, poggers, oh, best, best, best balloon joke of 1897. He would have been the best balloon joke of 1897 if he fucked this up, Alex. So the pressure was on. He had a million dollars, which again, in today's money, is 30 million an insane amount of money was tied into this project and the national pride. It's kind of like Hive Swap. Like, he had all this money and he set everything up and then things just weren't working. There was problems that he should have accounted for that he didn't. Or he overestimated his own calculations and how secure he was. Like, he's like, oh, my drag ropes, this thing works so well. It's fucking lit. It's awesome. I can do this. That and... Like, Nils Ekholm, he was a meteorologist, and he was like, yeah, no, we can, we can totally do this. 
because according to his according like it was scientific fact at that time that they knew how the winds moved but that wasn't true because they didn't have observational data of like the poles because no one had fucking been there so they just guesstimated how wind worked up there so like other people had warned him when he was doing his speeches like dude you are playing with a lot of fucking variables but he he was in too fucking deep he had to do it yeah okay so Andre doesn't invite Ekholm back the next year. Ekholm goes back to being a professor and lives until he's in like his mid seventies. A sad fate for a polar explorer. <laughs> well, I mean, didn't he basically never explore the pole anyway? We'll get there. Oh, okay. He won't get there, but we'll get there. <laughs> so Ekholm, Nils Ekholm goes back to being a teacher. He keeps Andre keeps Nils Strindberg. And replaces the other Nils with a young fella named Newt Frankel, a rugged outdoorsman with no meteorological experience or scientific know-how. Surprisingly, he actually did, like, a really good job. He was basically a scribe. He would note down everything that they did, everywhere they went, and just anything Andre told them to do, he would just mark it all down. Uh, important thing to note. Newt Frankel is the only one in this journey who isn't a pasty fucking nerd. <laughs> in the source I read, they described the uh, other explorers as inside people. <laughs> you know that image <laughs> where it's the, the morning leader and the yellow journalist? Strindberg no. and Andre were men of science with the mustaches to prove it. So everyone gathers at the launch site in the summer. They're all getting ready for it. The wind is blowing at their backs. They're, they're able to finally go north. The newspaper people that came out are freezing to death because they're in the fucking Arctic Circle. But they're like, yeah, yeah, good job. Woo, yeah, woo, yeah, get in there. Uh, they hop into the basket from this rickety-ass blight town scaffold, and they're on their way. And I could only find one person that said this, but apparently the last word that they heard Andre say was, Wait, what do you mean that's not working? <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but God almighty, I, w I hope it is. <laughs> because before they were even out of fucking sight of the reporters, Alex, things were going to shit. <laughs> so the balloon is immediately losing altitude because they had to wait later in that day and it was leaking 8 million tiny holes. Because hydrogen is very small. They're losing altitude and they're skimming across the water. <laughs> so the reason why was they lost a lot of hydrogen and the drag ropes were causing too much friction because they're dragging in the Arctic Ocean and freezing together into a giant clump of ice. <laughs> So they had to cut off the drag ropes. They had to take like a big like balloon safe machete or something and cut them off of the safety bolts. Which, by the way, those were Eckholm's idea. Bolts made to stop the ropes from flying off and taking the men to their doom was not part of Andre's original design. <laughs> so within 10 minutes, they lost 100% of their steering ability, which was down from like 1%. And the basket's still, like, coming up off the water and then, like, hitting ice and shit. So they have to get rid of more weight. So they just toss, like, all of their sandbags. They toss an extra 500 pounds of shit. They lost a third of their total weight within the first 15 minutes, Alex. And to make things even worse... They had so little weight that the balloon rose to 2,300 feet in the air... And the atmosphere was so thin, they lost even more hydrogen. Ugh. So, before it was clear of the launch site, the Eagle was reduced from a state-of-the-art flying machine into a fucking balloon. <laughs> so the crew okay, had I'll... not lost hope. Go ahead. What do you mean that's not working? <laughs> <laughs> One of the podcasts I listened to when I was researching this, they're like, all right, listen, listen, guys, this is how the plan's going to work. <laughs> it just lets go of the full balloon and <laughs> flies around. <laughs> okay, okay. Citation needed. That was the one. And I'll bring them back up later on because Continue. I had an experience researching this. 
<laughs> so they're like in the back of their minds they're just like oh god we're so <laughs> fucked we are so fucking dead but in their journals that the three kept they hadn't lost hope they were men of adventure and according to what they knew they did still technically have a pretty good shot of surviving this <laughs> so they weren't fools right like they kind of knew in the back of their head like oh fuck oh shit you know yeah they knew that there was a good chance, just from the outset, even before they lost everything, that they probably wouldn't be... There, there was a good chance they wouldn't be making it back from the trip, right? Like, 30%. Which, they thought it was 30% that they, like, would fail it, but it was more like 3% that they wouldn't fail it. So Andre devised two systems of communication with the world below that were at least as reliable as his drag ropes. The first was just steel buoys. Like, you know at a bank, where, like, you go to the drive-thru? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was those, and they could just drop them, like a bullet, from the balloon, and then it would land in the water, and then it would get sent by the currents to the... You, you know how densely populated Nordic shores are, right? Especially the northern ones? <laughs> yes. So that was their first method to try and let people know where they were and leave scientific like copies of notes and stuff. The other one was carrier pigeons in the Arctic. <laughs> Wait, how did they have, they just have a bunch of birds with them? They had 36 carrier pigeons on board. <laughs> okay. Out of the 36 pigeons, only one of them was found. It landed on a steamer ship near the start of the journey, and was immediately fucking shot. <laughs> so no one knows what it said, because as soon as it landed, they're just, blam! Which, I don't, Why? listen, I'm not, I'm not like a sailing scientist, but isn't that bad luck to, like, kill a seabird? I guess pigeons aren't seabirds. They probably looked at it like, why the fuck is there, oh, I'm sorry, doing it the Swedish chef voice, why the fuck is there a pigeon? <laughs> So, yeah, they had all these notes, and what the notes were is they were like, hey, here's some scientific data, you country bumfuck yokel, please take this to the newspaper so people can know where we are. Uh, one, there was a couple of them that were found, like two buoys, and that one pigeon, which immediately landed in the water, and it was disintegrated, <laughs> because that's technically still salt water up there, right? <laughs> so, uh, this is this is one of them, it's, uh, you know, within... This is 20 minutes after they left. Our journey goes well so far. We sail at an altitude of yada yada yada, whatever. Weather delightful. Spirits high. So the evidence shows that was a fucking lie. <laughs> the eagle was keeling left and right due to the uneven weight. It was flying too high and leaking hydrogen or being coated with thick ice and sinking low enough to give Strindberg seasickness from hitting the ground so often. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in Andre's journal eight touches in 30 meters bumpings every fifth minute paid visits to the surface about every 50 meters nevertheless humor good <laughs> all of this by the way is taking place in a fucking silent hill level dense arctic fog because fog forms when very cold air pot, like passes over warm water which in the arctic being warm just means not being ice. <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> so the eagle was airborne. How, how long do you want to guess that they were actually airborne for? Okay, it had to be at least five whole minutes. <laughs> at least that. You're correct. Uh, they were airborne for ten and a half hours. Oh, okay. Then they were skimming along the ground for two days. <laughs> They officially crash landed on July fourteenth, eighteen ninety seven. Crashed. I say crash landing is like, it was kind of light enough that like none of their shit was damaged because it's a balloon. I mean, it just kind of flops over. I guess. Their camera. They had two cameras that each weighed fifteen fucking pounds. Like these were heavy cameras. They were perfectly fine, and they were used by Strindberg throughout the rest of the journey to catalog like everything. He took out, he took like 200 or so photos. Uh, Andre didn't know this, but Strindberg was actually like, he enjoyed photography as a hobby. And he just didn't even know that when he selected him. He was like, oh, Strindberg's a good student. Let's get him on here. He, he had no idea. 
So there's a really fucking cool photo of Newt Frankel and uh, Andre pondering the balloon on the ice, like looking at it like, hmm, hmm. And it's uh, really cool. I have a, I have a few of them in the in the in the Imgur album because all of them because he had like he knew like he had like an eye for photography. So he was like spacing things out and making them look sick. It's kind of rad. So Andre had to make a decision. He set up two supply depots just in case the trip went badly. Almost like maybe he knew there wasn't like a 3% chance they were going to fail. And maybe it was a little bit bigger. So they were kind of halfway. They went 300, eh, it was like 500 total, whatever. But they were about 300 miles north of where they started. And it was 300 miles further north to reach the pole. So they were like, they had three options. They could go to the North Pole. They could go to one of the two supply depots, or they could go back home. So it was like the same distance each one. One of the supply things was back in Svalbard on like an eastern island, and the other one was on uh, was on like the Russian archipelago. So he debated the three, and he thought back on the reason for their journey, Alex. The reason why they're out here in the first place. To die in the <laughs> Arctic? He decided to go with expedition reason number one to just name a river and get out before they committed mutiny and fed him to a polar bear. He was not going to continue going to the North Pole. Okay, okay. So remind me, where do they crash land at exactly? On the 82nd parallel. So they were within eight degrees of the North Pole. They were about 300 miles south of it. Um, if you pull up the map, that's also in the Imgur album, you can see uh, they left July 11th they go, they go, they go, and then July 14th, they land way the fuck in the middle of the ocean. Because remember, it's all frozen over there, right? Yeah, so the, there's something to stand on over there. Yeah, it's just all ice. There is no land. Not for a very long time. So they, uh, they're they like, okay, okay. Well, they had the essentials. They had guns, ammo, snowshoes, sleds, tents, sledges, which are just fancy sleds that carry things. So Andre did something that a lot of white explorers do. He ignored the advice offered by indigenous people, the Inuits, and other explorers for some of his most critical things. Their clothes were these oil skins that were suited for cold climates, but dry ones. It was always fucking foggy out there. So their clothes would just absorb the water, and they would never fully dry. Oh, they must have been freezing. And Andre designed the sledges himself. The Inuits had generations of knowledge on how to build, like, big pieces of wood, like scaffolding that can carry across the ice. But Andre believed his design was better, because he was an engineering student. So his... Things were like these these big bulky monsters, and they would not so much as like glide across the ice as they would rip and tear their way across, just digging ruts in the ice. <laughs> so they would have to actually put on like these harnesses and carry each one of their payloads across the fucking wasteland, dragging it. So they spent a week camped out at the balloon. They set up a tent and they're like, OK, guys, let's figure this out. How are we going to do this? So uh, they planned everything out. They were going to go to the Russian archipelago because it was technically closer. I think it was like 300 there and it was like 400 and something to get to, to, to Svalbard again. So like, okay, boys, let's do this. So they, uh, they uh, sort everything in the balloon again. They take only the essentials. So they get their own drag ropes, basically, because each one of them had 400 pounds of shit on their sledge. So they were fucking having to carry all this weight amongst the three of them. Because there was uh, three tons. Then it went down to two tons because they threw everything off the fucking balloon. And now they're carrying amongst each other almost a whole nother ton. Like all they have right. half a ton of shit. So a lot of that weight was just fucking food and water. Apparently when they chose provisions for the trip, Andre didn't really give a shit about how heavy or portable it was. His reasoning was, we'll eat it or we'll yeet it. Like, if we don't eat it and it's heavy, we'll, we'll just fucking throw it overboard. Who gives a shit? Right. So their provisions were like heavy canned meat, crates of fucking wine and beer. Of course. 
cheese, condensed milk, lemon juice, whatever. Who gives a shit how heavy it is? It's not like this balloon has to float very long. So, uh, he did all this because he's like, oh, we're just going to be flying everywhere. I, who gives a shit? We'll be fine. So, uh, the Arctic fucking sucks, dude. <laughs> like, it is Pepe Hands. Is that a happy Pepe or sad one? I don't know Twitch emotes. I think Pepe Hands is sad. The ice, if it's not a flat sheet of ice with wind tearing you apart, it's a huge valley with unscalable ice ridges. If it's not a slushy ice pond, it's ice flows like a fucking Oregon Trail River, and these boys got 12 grandfather clocks. <laughs> Remember, too, there is no land. This is just ice, water, and sand. So if you step on the wrong thing, you're just gonna fucking fall in. My dudes, the, these fucking guys are totally unprepared for this. They don't have ice picks. They're carrying these fucking square sleds. I'm pretty sure they probably don't even have, like, the ice explorer cleats. They're out here with, like, the 1800s equivalents of fucking windbreakers and sketchers. <laughs> so these guys have been traveling for, like, a week, right? Southeast to try and get to the Russian supply depot. And one of them's like, wait. He takes out a map, he looks at the, you know, he tries to look up at the stars, you know, he's checking things, he's doing all these calculations, and it find out that the ice flow that they've been standing on and trying to, it's struggling over and carrying all this shit, was drifting northwest the entire time. Oh no! Geographically, for a week, they had moved like three miles south of their starting point. <laughs> so they're like, okay, okay, we're not losing hope. They decide, okay, let's change direction. Let's go to Svalbard. This thing's taking us east anyway. We might as well head south and it'll take care of the east portion for us. Or west. Whatever. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So they're like, okay, the ice is going to help us. And it would only be a seven-week death march. <laughs> so they dump half of each man's sled to try and lighten the load to move faster, right? So they go from 400 to 200 pounds each because they're like, we don't need this shit. Fuck it. The terrain was even worse in this direction. Ah. Oh. Frankel badly twists his knee and gets this really fucked up hideous blister. Oh. The other man had to help him walk and he was hurt too badly to push the sledges. So they dumped all that shit so that they could lighten their load and move faster. But it was for nothing. 600 pounds of provisions just dumped for no reason. Because they would have to carry their sledges. Then one of them would help Frankel move forward. And the other one would go back and grab his sledge and carry it back to where they were. So they would have to... It just took twice as long. Because they had to make two trips now every single time. So this went from bad to even worse is what you're saying. This is the Russian history of polar expeditions. <laughs> I <sighs> Okay, so I, I had to remind myself, what, what was the initial goal again? Just to get there, right? To prove this was during the heroic age of Arctic exploration. It was literally just a pissing contest to show how advanced and how manly people were in your country. Like, we're so fucking badass, we can go to the goddamn North Pole. It, that's really, and I mean, for him, it was to get funding just for his, you know, I, I wanted to cross, he wanted to cross the Atlantic. He wanted to cross the ocean. So this was his best way to get that money for it. So when they're crossing all this shit, they have to scale two story tall valleys in the ice with their 200 pounds of equipment pulling them down. They would sometimes have to crawl underneath these big frozen arches that could collapse at any moment and just fucking kill them all. Occasionally they would have to, they would reach a spot and there was just like a gash that just went down to the fucking water and they couldn't like pick up their sledges and throw it. They couldn't do that because they would fucking break or they wouldn't be able to make it. If their shit fell in the water, they're just fucked. Like you're, you're just dead. Yeah. So they would have to build bridges out of ice and snow to drag the sledges across. So despite all this, apparently they were in like good spirits. Like they were still pretty fine with it. Like I doubt they fucking that. 
they'd fucking goof and joke around with each other. I have a theory as to this that I'll, I'll mention later. All right. They'd fucking goof with each other, right? When one of them would come back from scouting ahead, they'd ask him, is it easy to get across? And the other one would respond, yes, it is easy. With great difficulty. Muffled sounds of razor sharp hail. Best <laughs> ice joke of 1897. <laughs> <laughs> in their fucking journals andre would write about how the arctic when it wasn't snow blinding them was like a frozen venetian landscape made of arches and fountains oh how joyous it is to be the first men here and making history strindberg would write long letters to his fiance anna about their arduous journey and the pride he felt in being the first man here franco would write down the weather that day Okay. I, I, That's all he had to write about. It, it, fuck. He, he doesn't want to fucking be here. <laughs> so their food stores are running low, right? Of and on course. a good day, they would make like three miles southwest. But the further south they got, the more seals, polar bear, and apparently algae that they could find. Because even though it's in the Arctic, like, it's not always completely frozen solid right yeah. sometimes it can get up to like 50 60 degrees you know from fuck all that global warming right yeah so andre would write in his journal about cooking algae soup and making polar bear blood pancakes and that it was a fairly important discovery for travelers in these tracks Apparently, polar bear blood pancakes, they would take... Because they, they would shoot, like, polar bears and seals. They would kill things because they dumped all their fucking food. Yeah. So they had to. They would eat, like... They would eat seal. They would eat anything that, you know, fish. They would fish sometimes. If they were lucky, they would find shit. The polar bear blood pancakes was polar bear blood, oatmeal, and, like, honey. And that was all it was, and you just compress it down, and you fry it, and you fry it, and you fry it in butter, and you flip it around, you fry it, you fry it, you fry it, and then you just eat it. Which, I'll be honest, I would, I would try a polar bear blood pancake. It sounds like fucking metal as shit, dude. <laughs> it, it sounds like some fake ass shit in a video game. So in September, remember they left in July. Yeah. So this is early September. They lucked out, and they came across a long stretch of open water. Their boat was one of the things that actually fucking worked because Andre didn't design it. Wait, they had a boat with them this whole fucking time? Well, yeah, they had a boat, but I mean, it's just completely ice. And it was just on one of the sledges and then filled with a bunch of shit. Yeah. It was an emergency boat. The boat was a bundle of sticks covered with leftover balloon silk. And God damn it, Alex, I really want to say the name they came up with for a boat made of a bundle of sticks, but I will not. We aim high on this show. <laughs> They please tell you it was actually called that, Tad. Don't. So they loaded up their stuff on the SS Faggot and paddled <laughs> out to the sea. <laughs> <laughs> so, coincidentally, this was September 4th, Strindberg's birthday, and Andre surprised him with a bunch of letters that his family wrote and gave to Andre to give to him as like a secret gift, right? Uh huh. And so Strindberg, for most of this, was, like, really forlorn, and he was, like, for some reason not super fucking psyched about <laughs> dying in the Arctic. I wonder why, dude. So he's, like, like, this perked him up. Like, Andre wrote in his journal, he's like, I'm glad that my friend Strindberg is in high spirits. So he gets these, he's reading them, he's like, oh, man. So later that same day, Strindberg falls in the water and they lose all their bread and sugar. What? <laughs> <laughs> It just gets worse, dude. So they've been traveling for like a month, right? Yeah. Traveling west from their from their site. If you check the map, in about the middle of it, uh, the ice sheet had switched to moving east again. And you can see a straight line where they just shoot to the right, 80 miles back towards the Russian supply depot. Oh, they, it just... God, as I was reading this, it started off like, ah, oh, look at these fucking morons, ha ha ha, hot air balloon, fucking retard, and I'm doing like the take the L dance from Fortnite. But now it's just like, fuck, dude, just stop, come on, give them a fucking break. <laughs> look, you animals, Leave them they're on. already dead. So the weather was starting to take a turn for the worse. Of course it was. Why wouldn't it? <laughs> it's starting to get fall. It's September. 
So fall's approaching and they agree that, okay, we need to bunker down and prepare for a long winter before we can keep trying to cross this ice because it is, it is so bad that we, we can't keep going. So Andre was an engineer, right? He was more of an engineer than a scientist. So using his actual area of expertise, he uh, helped to design a special igloo for them to build, him and Strindberg. So before this, they had shot three big fat fucking seals. <laughs> and that, plus the remaining food, would last them through half of the winter. So they're like, okay, okay, we can do this, guys. Andre hoped... Because he didn't know for sure. He hoped the ice flow would push them further south. And that they could live off the seals and fish to hibernate through the worst of it. Because as they kept going south, you know, it would be warmer. They would find animals. So they built a house there, right? Uh-huh. They made it out of ice and snow like an igloo. There's a picture of it in the in, in the album where it's got like a... They've got their three-person sleepover fucking uh, sleeping bag. They've got a table and a living room, and then like a storeroom. And for some reason, I don't know, you could tell me if I if you feel this too. Looking at it, like the design that they came up for it, it looks like something from fucking Dragon Ball Z. It looks like a capsule corp house, and I don't I can't like figure out why. <laughs> because it's so round, I guess. So, I guess so. Because all the houses in DBZ just have are just like like orb shaped. So everything was all built and everything was stored within like a couple days. And they just built it on the ice, and the men were finally able to relax and take a load off. Newt Frankel's blister had started to heal, and they were eating just fucking stacks of blood pancakes, right? <laughs> okay. How long do you think it takes before everything goes to hell? Uh, two days. Yes. So <laughs> two days later, the men are woken up by an explosion sound, rocking their whole house. Wait, what? The ice... The ice had ripped apart in the middle of their living room and was instantly flooding their entire house. (laughs) Once more, their supplies were hemorrhaged and dumped into the fucking ocean. Strindberg had to dive into the Arctic Ocean to fetch his letters and the other men's personal items before they sank. How did this happen? Fucking, the, the ice broke apart. The ice broke apart because in the Arctic, ice just rips and tears and spreads and separates. It just cracked, and the, yeah, the ice that they built on was 20 feet thick, but if you twist a fucking, if you take a fucking icicle and you crack it in half, it doesn't matter how thick it is, you twist it, you keep fucking with it, it's gonna snap. Fuck. So, they make a tent around another big stupid piece of ice, you know, they're just sitting, they moved like 30 feet off to the right, and this is where I started getting sus, and I didn't think that this was entirely true. Uh, Andre wrote that despite all that had happened, no one had lost courage. With such comrades, one should be able to manage under any circumstances. Oh yeah, I'm sure they were totally ready to fucking kick his ass and eat him. <laughs> now, here's what I think happened. So I looked at some of the storage things. They had two pounds of opium and morphine per person. Oh, okay. So they're just high as a fucking kite while they're doing this. I think... That they they were, like, all of them were psyched to be the first people to ever get to this area, right? But I think what was keeping them going was that, like, like Newt, you know, he fucking cracked his knee and shit. And he's like, alright, here, ha- have some opium, have some morphine. Fuck, it's really cold. Have some opium, have some morphine. <laughs> now, they weren't, I don't think they were dosing. Because I think what was happening is that they were getting, like, really bad diarrhea. Because... It, you're under so much fucking stress you're exhausted like you're eating blood pancakes yeah you're eating blood pancakes and like not fully cooked polar bear which by the way apparently polar bear meat is so tough because i could only cook it on that shitty fucking hot plate stove (laughs) that fucking andre had to make a fork for frankel out of like wire because they would stick his fork in it it would just snap (laughs) And then he couldn't eat it. <laughs> okay, okay. So so oh. I think that they were, like, dosing on mo- on or- on morphine and opium so that they didn't even feel the cold, they didn't feel the pain. And they were just like, we're gonna fucking get home, we're gonna get this, guys, don't fucking worry about it, we're Gucci, we got this, we're explorers, we fucking made it, bro. Okay, In the so- meantime, like, their ears are just falling off. 
All right, let's try to, try to map this out. Okay, so I'm looking at the map here. So they're at the September area, right? We move to the right? Yes, September okay. 12th. So they're on that stopping point right here. So from all right, so we start with the balloon, move over here, drop a shitload of stuff immediately, swivel all over the place, swivel all over the place, crash land, slowly drag all your shit, dump it, your guy breaks his fucking leg, dump more shit, and <laughs> travel over here, get to an igloo, dump it. So what's left? What is left at this point in their fucking boxes that they're carrying with them? They basically have seal meat, polar bear meat, uh, some fruits, some stuff that just like stop scurvy. Like they have lemon juice, limes and shit. And, uh, and apparently not enough, based on what other explorers said, to avoid scurvy. They had, like, the most essential of the most essentials. And then they were rolling the dice on if they could actually find other edible food. Which is why they were making algae soup and blood pancakes and shit. Yeah, okay. So. This is reminding me of what happened with the HMS Terror. So they lost everything again, right? Yeah. The reason the ice sheet broke was because it was crushing up against White Island, which is a small outcropping north of Svalbard. The men had seen birds flying in that direction, so they were hurrying, 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 right? Yeah. If you look at the map, they're um they're closer to the to the October 6th. October 2nd was when they built the igloo, which would be, you know, a little bit above Kivtoya. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why they were able to, after this happened, they're like, okay, we, we got to keep going. So they're just drudging along. They see the seabirds. They're like, oh shit, if there's seabirds. That means there's actual land. So let's, you know, they, after the igloo got destroyed, Andre, who had been keeping the most up-to-date notes, kind of stopped writing things. Oh, that's, that's not good. The pages that were written down after this, because everything was written in pencil, right? Because it's the fucking Arctic. They, uh, they, scientists had, like, figured out what he wrote in his journal, and it was just, like, it was mostly illegible, or it was talking about the seven-day death march that they had to do to get to this island, because it was now getting legitimately into winter in the fucking Arctic Circle. They have these fucking inch-thick fucking seal shirts. Like, they got, (laughs) they're wearing fucking New Balance they're not prepared, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> it takes them six days. Six days after their igloo is destroyed to reach this island. Right? Yeah. And then he stops writing in his journal. And there is one last clean entry. And it's written in ink. It was dated October 17th, 1987. And it just said, home at 7.05 a.m. This was written before the journey. Because ink would have frozen in the Arctic. So he wrote that in there thinking, I'm going to be back. I'm going to be on a train home to Sweden, October 17th. And he would like write in his stuff and he would flip back to that page. And then go back and like finish writing his entry and shit every night. Yeah. So 33 years later, it's 1930. And it is an exceptionally warm, global warming, exceptionally (laughs) warm summer in the Arctic. Uh, there's a whaling expedition that's on a hunt, and they're like, hey, let's try to find some walruses on White Island. Sometimes walruses are there. A few dudes go up there, and they find this boat. They're like, yo, what the fuck? And the boat's full of provisions. It's full of canned food. It's full of meat. It's, it looks like it hasn't been touched. Deep around the island, they find like an anchor, and they clean it up, and it says Andre Polar Expedition. So they found the they found the camp and they found the remains of the three men. Oh. So Strindberg had died first. And Andre and Frankel, they went to the uh to the only like rocky area that was above the ice, and they kind of put him in the rocks so that what you know he was buried, but he wasn't touching this godforsaken fucking ice. Andre and Frankel passed in their tent. Uh, the provisions were left on the shore and a pile of driftwood was sitting next to them. They were too exhausted from the cold to even go out there and get their food and bring it in. Like, they made it 300 miles back to the Svalbard Islands that they launched from 
They launched from the west side and they arrived on the east side. Like, they were within 60 miles of uh, civilization. There's there's a bunch of theories as to how they died. Some people say it was trichinosis from eating uh, polar bear meat, which is like something that really just fucks with your stomach. Maybe it was the Primus stove. It might have been damaged. It was leaking gas in the tent. Maybe it was X. Maybe it was Y. There's a uh, really fucking cool quote written when they were still in the balloon after the other men fell asleep that Andre put. And don't pretend I'm doing a racist Swedish chef voice for this one, because this is actually a pretty fucking sick quote. All right. So, it is not it is not a little strange to be floating here above the polar sea, to be the first that have floated here in a balloon. How soon, I wonder, shall we have successors? We think we can well face death having done what we have done. Isn't it all, perhaps, the expression of an extremely strong sense of individuality? I, I fucked that word up, but you know what I meant. Yeah. Which cannot bear the thought of living and dying like a man in the ranks, forgotten by coming generations. Is this ambition? So it was October 5th, 1930, that they, uh, after they, so 33 years after they arrived on the island, like, six days, almost exactly 33 years, they were escorted by five destroyers and Stockholm or uh, Sweden's finest military aircraft, which I'm not going to say anything disparaging about Sweden, but you know, I'm, you know, yeah. So uh, when they arrived, they were hailed as heroes, and people were like, "Yo, holy shit, they're back!" And for the final barrier, that they were, they were each of the three, they were cremated and buried in a plot of land in Stockholm that does not freeze over. So his uh, Strindberg's wife, um, she uh, she actually died in 1949. And I found this like maybe five minutes before we recorded. But I thought this is fucking weird. She left special instructions to her new husband that when she died, that she wanted her heart removed from her body and buried near the urn that contained Strindberg's ashes. That's uh, uh we are what? <laughs> I don't know. I just I read that. I'm like, all right, that's that's kind of fucking weird. But yeah, these dudes, they fucking made it. And so when I was doing the research for this one, it took me a long time because I mentioned them earlier. There was like a, a, a citation needed podcast where it was just five dudes yucking it up about these fucking weirdos and their stupid fucking balloon. Right. Yeah. And I was on board with it. I'm like, ah, oh, dude, check these fucking idiots. God, the Swedish are so dumb. And then I listened to another podcast where it was like, okay, but here's the other side of the story. Like, here's here's actually looking at what Andre did and not treating him as if he was a dumb fucking moron from a town of 3,000 people. And I kept, like, hopping between, like, left and right, left and right, hopping between them. I ended up like, this dude... Listen, Alex, I'm just gonna say, I love balloonists. I think they're fucking nuts. <laughs> I... I didn't expect them to die. I don't. I, I had. I had hope that their spirits would, would remain strong the whole way. I'm actually surprised they ended up dying at the end there. It was too much. It was fucking three months on the ice of the Arctic with like basically being nude. <laughs> they last. I'll tell you right now. They lasted longer than I would have. <laughs> so. This reminds me of another story. I can make it kind of brief, which was the HMS Terror. Have you heard of this story? I have heard a little bit about it. I think it was the, um, like, Admiral Robert Perry or something. Was that the guy? I think that was his name. I forget the name. I just remember the story itself. Where it was, this was in 1813. So this was a little before this. Where they wanted a, an easy, like, trade route go, cutting through the Arctic. And they thought, hey... As long as we get bundled up, that won't be too bad. They, they had no idea. They had no idea how thick ice could get up there. Because they didn't bring, like, ice-cutting ships. They just brought, like, old retired warships called the Terror. And so they got up there. The boat gets stuck. So they all just had to start hoofing it across the fucking Arctic. All the crewmen. And what would happen is, is that they did this adventure when they just invented canned food. So they had a fuckload of canned food, but it was the first time anyone made it, so there wasn't any, like, safety. So most of them weren't sealed properly, so half of them were already, like, spoiled. 
and the other half had too much lead in it and was lead poisoned, so they only had a quarter of their actual food that was edible. So, Fuck. after traveling so far, like, the, it would get stuck, it would thaw over, move a little further when it, when it warmed up, stuck again, just hold out for a year, move again. They eventually just gave up said, fuck it, and just started huffing it. And, uh, slowly started to die one by fucking one, until they got to fucking, like, ah, uh, fuck, what was it, like, King's Island or something? Especially just an island full of fucking gravel, nothing there. Which is where they all perished... And there were signs of actual cannibalism happening. They were just so desperate for food, they started killing each other. Oh, uh, dude, the Arctic is fucked. We just, we're just we a bunch of fucking, fucking hairless monkeys. We're not supposed to be there. But at the same time, like, there's like a million firsts for the Arctic. One of them was, uh, it was this Russian dude in 1998. It was the first scuba dive at the North Pole. Ha! <laughs> This fucking dude, he went in there, he dove 50 meters deep, and he was, so they were supposed to go, it, it's it's so fucking cold, that when you go in there, water gets inside your suit, and your body just starts having a stroke. Like, as a result, it just starts spasming and you can't control it. It's so bad that what they did is they had these people out there, right? And they set up these tents, they, they would cut a hole in the ice, and then they would have people constantly chopping it. Because within 10 minutes, it would just refreeze. <laughs> you would go down there, and your body would start spasming. And down there, they saw fucking, like, jellyfish. Fucking algae. And these giant crystal clear, like, lights. Like, these these pyramids underwater of ice that just formed, like, icebergs. Shining these weird fucking lights. So this dude went down there, and he's like, what the fuck is this? And he kept going deeper and deeper after the lights until his equipment failed and then the other divers had to go down there and get his body before their own shit fucking failed and they started having a stroke right uh it wasn't until like 1908 that we actually had someone that got to the north pole it was this u.s uh, admiral robert perry who do you remember that south park episode with the adventurers league <laughs> yes that was actually a thing. This guy was the president of the Explorers Club in New York City. So this guy, he actually made it to the North Pole because he actually fucking listened to the Inuit people. He actually listened when they told him, like, hey, here's how you build a sled that actually goes over the ice. And he's like, mm-hmm, yes, yes, yes. I will not kill your village. <laughs> He was also the guy, there was a dollop episode that we listened to a long time ago where he's like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to take your seven best people of your tribe and also this meteorite, which is the only source of flint that your fucking tribe has to make fire. I'm just going to take this. All right. Bye. All right. Bye. And he just like brought these people in like a, like a fucking slave ship. Like, you know how they like in cages and shit and then dropped them off in New York and then left. And then, like, four of them almost instantly died of polio. And the other three, like, didn't know anything. They had no idea what was happening. It was a, it was a fucking shit show. Robert Perry is a monster. We might cover him later. <laughs> oh, yeah. Andre is the fucking dude. He made... He's the people's champion, Alex. He might not have made it there. But god damn it, he got close enough for me. Uh. Oh, fuck. What a fucking... Oh, I'm so sad, dude. I'm so invested in that arc, dude. God, when I was reading it, I was like, yeah! Like, when they built the ice house, I was like, fuck yeah! Ooh, Gary, Gary! I was fucking hyped, dude. But then, no. It just... It was the ups and downs. It was like a roller coaster. Much too exciting for those 1800s folk. Oh, uh, you know what's not too exciting for them? Uh, What? Uh, the, let me tell you about the famous, uh, famous podcast. You can find it on YouTube's, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify. Found out today if you search. Oh, no, you can't find it on Google Play. It's a YouTube podcast now or whatever. I found out on Spotify that you have to put the space in between. Let me tell you about where it shows some random guy who re-uploaded a bunch of the podcast episodes. Uh, Discord in the description. If you forgot about that, there's Patreon in the description. I didn't forget about that one. Uh, <laughs> um, this is a fun episode. Uh, I wanted, I started this episode looking for other 
for a completely different topic about a chess playing robot. And somehow I ended up with a hot air balloon over the Arctic. So thanks for listening. Uh, unless Alex has some funny, hilarious may may to say. Uh, if you're going to the, <laughs> all right, Ted, Ted, I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. What happened to the Russian scuba diver whose equipment failed in the Arctic? What happened, Alex? He was destroyed. Ha! Best Arctic scuba diving joke of 1998.